Let's open up our Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Tonight we're going to be taking a look at some lessons having to do with worship from the Gospels. We've been making our way through the Scriptures, through the Pentateuch, the first five books, the Kings and Kingdoms, the Prophets. Last night we took a little look at the Psalms. Now we want to see what the Gospels have to say to us about worship and Of course, just like we sang in the last song, we're going to focus on Jesus. What else would you focus on? And so there's really three main points that I want to go over with you. We could talk endlessly about worship from the Gospels, just like we could about it. But I've I've drawn it down to these three points. Number one, we want to learn from how people worshipped Jesus. Number two... We want to learn about what Jesus taught about worship, at least on one occasion. And then number three, we want to learn about or learn from how Jesus himself worshiped. So Matthew chapter, excuse me, I said six, uh, turn over a couple chapters, Matthew chapter eight, verses one and two. And when he had come down from the mountain, Great multitudes followed him, and behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. One of the fascinating things about the Gospels is how often it was that people worshipped Jesus and, of course, how he received this worship. It's quite striking. Now, We left kind of the biblical flow with Pastor Josh in our previous session talking about the prophets and the great idolatry that the prophets addressed. And because of Israel's great idolatry, God brought judgment upon the tribes of Israel. First, the northern kingdom of Israel conquered by the Assyrians. And then secondly, the southern kingdom of Judah conquered by the Babylonians. And their idolatry was chronic. They kept returning back to it again and again. Baal, Ashereth, Molech, other gods. Again and again and again, they would worship these gods. But there was something significant about the Babylonian exile. When the Babylonians came and destroyed Jerusalem, burned the temple, left Jerusalem a ruin, depopulated uh, the whole area, it, it did something to the psyche of Israel. Never again did Israel have any significant problem with the gross idolatry that bothered them before. You don't find Israel having a trouble with Baal or Ashereth or Molech after the Babylonian exile. I I don't know what it was. It was strong medicine, but in some sense, it almost seemed to cure them of that kind of idolatry. But here's the thing, we... We, as Josh mentioned, we're idol factories, aren't we? You you take away one idol and we can make another idol. And there's a case to be made that among the things that became idols for Israel after the Babylonian exile was the temple itself. Now, the temple in the days of Zerubbabel and Ezra Uh, Later on, the the days when Nehemiah was rebuilding the walls, that temple was pretty humble. They didn't have a lot of resources. They didn't have a lot of expertise. They did the best they could, and they rejoiced over it, and appropriately so. But a few hundred years later, a man named Herod the Great came. And Herod the Great was an amazing builder, a man of vision, a man who had to have the best architects on staff that you could ever imagine. The things he built all over his part of the Roman world are staggering, but perhaps his greatest accomplishment was what he did with the temple. Now, he didn't rebuild the temple, but he so extensively remodeled, he so extensively improved that little humble temple originally built in the days of Zerubbabel and Ezra that, that, you know, you could, nobody calls it this, but you could almost call it Herod's temple. 
It was an amazing work of architecture, stunning. It, it drew admirers from all over the world. They, they used to say that when you visited the land of Israel in the ancient world, there were three wonders, three things that blew the mind of an ancient visitor to the land of Israel, in the days of Rome and shortly before that. They said, here were the three things. Number one, you had a sea without fish. Of course, they're talking about the Dead Sea. They said, number two, you've got a day without work. You have the Sabbath. And that was kind of unknown in the ancient world. So you've got a sea without fish. You've got a day without work. And you have a temple without a God. And what do they mean by that? Well, in the temple in Jerusalem, there was no statue. There was no statue to Zeus. There was no statue to Poseidon. The, the expression of an empty temple to, to be the representation of a God that could not be held in a building made with hands. So, Jesus comes along and he does something mind-blowing and kind of offensive to some of the Jewish people of his day. He says, I'm greater than the temple. Some of you all have made an idol out of the temple. Stop worshiping the temple. I receive your worship as the everlasting God. So repeatedly in the Gospels, Jesus is worshiped. The wise men worship Jesus. A leper worshiped Jesus. We're going to see about that in just a moment. Jairus in Matthew chapter 9 worships Jesus. The Gadarene demoniac worshiped Jesus. The man born blind worshiped Jesus. The disciples in the boat worshiped Jesus. The Syrophoenician woman worshiped Jesus. Mary Magdalene and Mary of Bethany worshiped the risen Jesus on the day his resurrection was revealed. The disciples after the resurrection worshiped Jesus. And the disciples at the ascension of Jesus, they worshiped him. And those are just the specific uses of that kind of term, worship or worship. Reference to Jesus. That's a lot of worship. And at no point did Jesus say, whoa, 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 don't worship me. Worship God alone. No, he received this worship because Jesus was and is and eternally remains God worthy of our worship. If you think of the whole picture, it's really staggering. Jesus in the Gospels is worshipped by Jews and Gentiles, by men and women, in Israel and outside of Israel, in synagogues and, in, and by, um, by synagogue rulers and by lepers, by wise men and by demoniacs. He's worshipped on the land and he's worshipped on the sea. And those who were worth, with Jesus all the time worshipped him and those who just met him at a moment worshipped him. Now, this particular case that we want to look at. It's just therefore just almost a, uh, an example of all the different ways Jesus was worshiped. Look at it here, verses one and two. I'll read it again. When he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshiped him saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. This man not only begged Jesus for a healing, he worshiped him. William Barclay, who's a pretty good commentator when it comes to Greek vocabulary and historical things. There's other things you'll get very frustrated with William Barclay about, but Greek words, he's, he gives a good explanation. He says, the Greek verb is proskaninen, and that word is never used of anything but worship of the gods. It always describes a man's feeling and action in the presence of the divine. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. In which gospel is this presented to us in this story right here? This is the gospel of Matthew. It's not a trick question. And to whom did Matthew direct his gospel? To the Jewish people. I mean, Matthew gives more particular instances of people worshiping Jesus than any other gospel writer, and he does it deliberately. Matthew knows exactly how this will play with his audience. A reverend Drew would read this and go, whoa, a man's receiving worship? Who is this man? 
And that's exactly what Matthew wanted them to think. So think about how this leper worshipped Jesus. Well, first of all, he worshipped Jesus by simply coming to him, making an effort. In, I don't know exactly what to call it, church world, sometimes we, we talk about churchgoers a little bit dismissively. God bless the churchgoers. God bless the people who do what this leper did and at least came to Jesus. Now, now we hope that people's um, commitment, that their heart, that their investment goes beyond just attendance, but it's good that it at least begins there. And this man came to Jesus and he honored Jesus as the one who could meet his otherwise impossible need. You, you got to admit, he honored Jesus by saying, Jesus, I'm coming to you to ask you to heal me of my leprosy. I can't go to anybody else. But right there, Jesus, I'm saying that you are different than any other person who walks this earth because I'm going to ask you to do something about my leprosy. This leper worshiped Jesus with his posture. Almost certainly, he was bowing or kneeling before Jesus. He, he may have been completely laid out. That's the basic idea behind that verb, proskuneo, or whatever it is. It, it's to lay out before somebody. And, and he may have literally been doing that. His posture reflected praise. He worshiped Jesus with the word, notice how he addressed him, Lord. Now, it's true that the ancient Greek word that we translate Lord in the New Testament, kurios, it has a range of meanings. meanings. Uh, j- just like the English word Lord can have a range of meanings. You, if, if somebody could be called Lord and you're speaking of them as God. Uh, somebody could be called Lord and you just mean that they're a member of the House of Lords in the English Parliament. Uh, you, you could call, you know, the, um, the, the, the dog who dominates your backyard. He's the Lord of my backyard. I mean, we could use it in several different senses. And it's the same way with this particular word. But notice, Matthew knows exactly what he's doing because not only does the leopard call, did I say leopard? <laughs> not only did the leper call Jesus Lord, but he worshiped him. Again, the, the, the readers... Original readers of Matthew's gospel understand he's calling him Lord, not just as a respectful address. This is far more than sir. This is God, your Lord. He also worshiped Jesus with his humility. He didn't demand anything of Jesus. He didn't come to Jesus and say, Jesus, you have to heal me. It's funny, you know that's probably how he felt. (laughs) But what did he say? Look at his words there in verse 2. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Please, Lord. I come to you in humility. I realize I don't have the place to demand anything of you, but I come to you humbly. And he also worshiped Jesus by respecting the power of Jesus. You see, in the mind of this leper, All that was necessary was for Jesus to want to do it. Jesus, I know you can do this. All you have to do is be willing. He's honoring Jesus this way. And then he also worshiped Jesus with confidence that Jesus could make him more than healthy. What did he want to be made? Clean. You know, there there was a tremendous moral stigma attached to the disease of leprosy in biblical times. So much so that there were some rabbis that distinguished themselves by bragging about how badly they treated lepers. You know, they would boast among themselves. Well, you know, when I see a leper coming on my side of the street, I walk over to the other side of the street. He goes, well, I outdo you even by that. When I see a leper coming down, I start throwing rocks at him. These are literal things from rabbinical writings. I start throwing rocks at him to chase him away even further. 
Le- leprosy was seen to be sort of this idea of, of, hey, this is not only something that is a disease, but it carries a moral, I need to be made clean, is what the leper says to Jesus. And of course, you know what happened. Jesus healed him. But don't miss the place of, of worship. And there's something especially beautiful about the leper's worship. Because this is worship that comes before the rejoicing. You know, I, I mean, isn't it beautiful when God answers prayer and the victory's won and we rejoice together? And listen, I don't want to take anything away from the, the power and the beauty of that kind of thing. Praise the Lord for the great things that he's done. But this is, this is worship that comes to Jesus. My need is yet unmet, but I will come and worship you. Doesn't that teach us about something about how we should worship the Lord? Again, I, I know I mentioned a little bit about this before, but I'll, I'll just say it again. It's very easy for us to sublimate everything we feel about worship, to put it under how we feel. And there is something so beautiful, so glorious about coming to God when you feel rotten and don't feel like worshiping at all and just say, Lord, I do not feel this at all, but I come and to the best of my ability, I bring you a sacrifice of praise. And you got to say, don't you think, I I don't want to speak for the Lord on this, but I'm just thinking out loud a little bit here. Don't you think that maybe God is much more pleased with that than in those moments when like it's the easiest thing in the world for us to worship? And when it's the easiest thing in the world for we love it. But you got to think there's something so beautiful about it before God's throne. It's like, my dear child doesn't feel like worshiping me at all. And here they are honoring me. That's got to feel wonderful unto the Lord. A sweet smelling savor before him. All right, that's number one. What we see about how Jesus was worshiped. Here's number two. Let's take a look at what Jesus taught about worship. And for that, we want to give our attention. You'll recognize this passage immediately. John chapter 4. I'm going to start beginning to read at verse 20. John chapter 4, verse 20. Of course, we're dropping in here in the middle of Jesus' conversation with the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well. So she seemingly wants to kind of distract Jesus in the conversation by bringing up a question about worship. Verse 20, our fathers worshiped on this mountain. You can almost see her pointing to the mountain when she does that. Our our, our fathers worshiped on this mountain and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, who's called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. That a beautiful interaction of Jesus. We're just taking one little piece of this interaction. But you can see what the woman's saying. She's saying, Jesus, listen, our fathers, the Samaritans, and the Samaritans were sort of a, a subgroup of Judaism. I, I talked about the exile when the Assyrians came and when the Babylonians came and pushed everybody out of the land. They took them out of the land. Well, there were a few people who remained and other people came in and these were sort of, and I... Uh, forgive me if the term's offensive. I'm not trying to offend anybody, but th- these were people, uh, l- sort of half-breeds, half-Jewish, half-Samaritan, and, and in some ways, lots of people didn't like them. And they had their own center of worship, if I remember correctly, on Mount Gerizim was where it was. But she's pointing to this mountain. On this mountain is where our fathers worshiped. And 
what about this, Jesus? And Jesus answers her very clearly. Listen, verse 22, isn't it fascinating what Jesus said? You worship what you do not know. You see, the, the Samaritans believed that Moses commissioned an altar on Mount Gerizim, that mountain of blessing, and that was their justification of their system of worship on that mountain. But, but like many things that try to, to syncretize, bring together a lot of different sort of religions and faiths together, it was just confusion. Jesus said, lady, I'm, in all respect, you don't know what you're worshiping. You worship what you do not know. Notice what the next phrase is. We know what we worship. Now, friends, could this not be said of many worshipers today? You worship what you do not know. They have an experience, but it isn't really rooted in any knowledge of God. Look, I, you know, I'm, I'm a Bible teacher. I'm a preacher, a pastor. I, I have a great love for God's word. I, I esteem it very highly. I love to communicate God's word. And, and it, it's easy for kind of my perspective, my personality, my giftedness in a church to be like, listen, what we really need is Bible knowledge. And we do. But it is true as well that we need experiential contact or encounter or connection with God. Not, not merely a head full of Bible facts. We're not standing before a congregation saying, we're going to make you the best equipped Bible trivia people in the entire city. That's not the goal. It's to lead people in real relationship with Jesus Christ. So you, you can err on either side. You can fall off on either side of the horse. You, you could become all knowledge and no experience, but you can also be all experience and no knowledge. And Jesus is speaking to this woman who's on that side of all experience and no knowledge. You worship what you don't even know. Salvation is of the Jews. And it's true of many people today. Again, their, their worship isn't really rooted in any knowledge of God. If you were to ask them, well, tell me what's so wonderful about God. Now, look, I understand any one of us asked a question, we get that little deer in the headlights kind of thing, you know. But I mean, if they had a moment to think about, well, I, I don't know, what is wonderful about God? Well, he knows all, he loves all, he cares all, he did all. Look at these great things that God did for me. Articulate, I have a reason. You know, we wouldn't think this is good in a human relationship, would we? Well, uh, tell me why. You, tell me what you love about your wife. Oh, I don't know. Okay, no, I know you're a little flustered. Just give yourself a little bit of time. Tell me about, let, come back to me in five minutes and tell me what do you love about your wife? Five minutes goes by. Well, I don't know. I just, I just love her. Well, it, is, is she pleasant to be around? I don't know. Um, does does she, she make for a happy home? I don't know. Is she pretty? I don't know, maybe. You're like, let's sign this fella up for some marriage counseling. There's something really wrong. But, but by analogy, wouldn't it be really something similar with people worshiping what they do not? That, okay, there's something about the music. There's something about the passion. There's something about the environment. That they're drawn to that. But is there any real connection with the God who reigns in heaven? Are they worshiping, but they know not? That was this woman's problem. And you got to say it has the potential for danger to, to be seeking after spiritual experience unmoored from the truth of God's word can lead people into dangerous places. As the same, I would say, to be devoted to God's word and rejecting any real experience with God can lead people into dangerous places. That's why it's so beautiful when Jesus says in verse 23, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. I'm telling you about a time that's coming 
when you, you Samaritans, when everybody, you're no longer going to worship in the way you thought of before. And you know, the prophets of the Old Testament often spoke of the day when all the nations would worship the God of Israel. And the people of Israel thought that that meant that they would all convert to Judaism. That's just how they thought. Okay, oh, the nations are going to come and worship our God. They're all going to become Jewish people. And it wasn't revealed to them. It wasn't revealed until the New Testament prophets, the New Testament apostles, that actually God was going to do something that he didn't talk about in the Old Testament. This is one of the mysteries that Paul talks about in the New Testament, in his letters, especially Ephesians, where he says God's plan was not to make all the Gentiles become Jews so that they come to Jesus. But no, what he's going to do is God's going to create one new man out of the two. And out of the Jew, out of the Gentile, he's going to make one new man in Christ. He's going to make the church. Then Jesus says in verse 24, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. God's looking for people to worship him. Isn't that what Jesus said? I don't know. It'd be interesting to do a study on this sometime. My, my curiosity is excited right now. I should go into what in the Bible does it say God looks for? Because there's a few places where God says he's looking for things. One of the things he's looking for is worshipers. But those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, what does it mean to worship God in spirit? I, I, look, I, I think that could be an hour on its own. But let's just kind of say it briefly. It means that you're concerned with spiritual realities, not so much places or outward sacrifices or cleansings or trappings. You're, you're, you're concerned with spiritual realities. Your focus is not on the material, on the tangible, but something spiritual. And as I told you before, the Jewish people in the days of Jesus were very focused on the temple in their worship. And it's easy to see why the temple was spectacular. It was really something for them to be proud of. But God needs to be worshipped in spirit. And friends, let me tell you, buildings, liturgical forms, ceremonies, vestments, rituals, These may have their place among Christians in worship, but only as they facilitate worship in spirit. If God isn't worshiped in spirit, then your tradition or liturgy, ceremony, it just really doesn't matter much. If those things can contribute to worship in spirit, then I got to say, I'm not a very liturgical guy, but, but if another believer says, no, These things really do help me to worship God in spirit. Well, I'm not going to question them, but I'm just saying that is their ultimate value. And what is it to worship God in truth? This means that you worship according to the whole counsel of God's word, especially in light of the New Testament revelation. You come to God, first of all, in the truth of his word, But may I add another angle to that? You also come to God in the truth of who you are. I'm kind of fond of saying it like this. You need to bring the real you to the real Jesus. That's where transformation happens. Now, how do you find the real Jesus? Here, this book. This book from Genesis to Revelation reveals to you the real Jesus. And how do you bring the real you? Well, stop being a phony. Stop putting on your church face. Stop acting like everything's okay when it's not. Stop acting like you're righteous when really your life is filled with sin. Come to God as the sinner you are. Bring the real you to the real Jesus And that's where transformation comes. Isn't that at least part of what it means to come to God in truth? Not only God's truth, but in the truth about who I am without pretense. Now, many years ago, this thought, this desire to worship God in spirit and in truth was put into words that for decades was on the back of a church bulletin. A church bulletin is like a folding piece of paper (laughs) that used to be handed to people. 
like, I don't know, about a thousand years ago. When people would come into church, you know, they, they didn't have things on screens unless they busted out that overhead projector, which was awesome. They, they would give people a bulletin. And on the back of a bulletin of a particular church, now this church had an amazing pastor. His name was Pastor Chuck Smith. And and some of you may not hardly know who Chuck Smith is, and that's okay. But but you, you should learn a little something. Because this church that you sit in now, and I suppose many of the churches that you're involved in, are connected in some way to Chuck Smith and this work that God did in and through him in Orange County, California, starting in the late 1960s. And let me say, if in your church or in your ministry, you really have no formal connection to Calvary Chapel, I'm really glad you're here. You're, You're absolutely welcome. But a lot of us just kind of share that common background. Some of us, whether we know it or not. And man, are we grateful for it. Because we, we don't want to make an idol out of anyone or anything. But you know, God, God really used Chuck Smith in a marvelous way. And on the, the bulletin, the back of the bulletin that they used to hand out at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa, that was the name of his church, they, they had this section. I want to read it to you because it's about worship. We believe that the only true basis of Christian fellowship is Christ's agape love, which is greater than any differences we possess and without which we have no right to claim ourselves Christians. Praise the Lord. We believe worship of God should be spiritual. Therefore, we remain flexible and yielded to the leading of the Holy Spirit to direct our worship. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, if you do that, it might drive your slide projection crew a little bit crazy. <laughs> Whoa, that song wasn't in the list. Where are they going with that? It, it, it's okay. Third, we believe worship of God should be inspirational. Therefore, we give great place to music in our worship. I, I like that because it's admitting that there's more to worship than music. And there is. We need to emphasize that again and again and again. However, biblically speaking, music and song is an important way that we worship God. Number four, we believe worship of God should be intelligent. Therefore, our services are designed with great emphasis upon the teaching of the word of God that he might instruct us how he should be worshipped. That's kind of what we're doing this whole conference, isn't it? Lord, how do you want us to worship you? And then finally, just this section. There, there was a little bit more to it on the back of the bulletin. This section, though, it says, we believe worship of God should be fruitful. Therefore, we look for his love in our lives as the supreme manifestation that we have been truly worshipping him. I guess if you're a great worshiper, if you really worship God in spirit and in truth, there's going to be love in your life. His agape love will flow in and through you. I I think that that, those words from the back of an old church bulletin say a lot about worshiping God in spirit and in truth. All right, in our final thing, we want to take a look at how Jesus worshipped. But I'm kind of sneaking this up on you because how Jesus worshipped is going to be in two parts. The first one is Jesus showed that worship was relevant to the joys of life. Uh, Turn to Luke chapter 10, verse 21 is what we're going to look at or start at verse 21. So I I want you to see Jesus was one who received worship. Jesus was one who taught about worship. But don't miss this. Jesus was one who himself worshiped. 
Jesus was a worshiper. Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 21. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit. Literally, the ancient Greek there says that he was thrilled with joy. I mean, this is strong wording here. Jesus rejoiced in the spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. We almost feel like we're intruding on this personal conversation between Jesus and his father, this personal praise that Jesus has with his father. It's so beautiful. But he's pouring out his heart in what? In joy. He's rejoicing in the spirit. By the way, this is the only occasion in the gospels, unless I'm missing something, which is entirely possible, but but it's the only occasion in the gospel where it's specifically said that Jesus rejoiced. It stands alone. Now, I'm not trying to apply for a month. This was the only time Jesus rejoiced. I don't think that Jesus was a morose, depressed man. L- listen, if sin takes away from life, then Jesus had more life in him than anybody else. If sin leads to sadness, Jesus was the most happy or unsad person ever to walk this earth. If communion with God makes for an abundant life, Jesus had a more abundant life than anybody. So not for a moment I'm suggesting this is the only time Jesus rejoiced. It's just the only time it's specifically said of him in the Gospels. And what did he do? He says this, verse 21, I thank you, Father. Jesus' joy made him break into praise and thanksgiving of God. I thank you, Father, for your wisdom, for your plan. I thank you for my own unique relationship with you. I praise you, Father, for the work you're doing. I praise you for your wise, sometimes unexpected plan. Lord, look, at you're using these babes. Lord, you use these losers, these disciples. Jesus never called them that. We preachers carelessly do that. But you use these unlikely, that's much more polite, isn't it? These unlikely people you used. Thank you for that, Lord. Jesus thanked his father profusely and with great joy. And he says in verse 21 that you've hidden these things from the wise and prudent and you've revealed them to babes. Isn't that where we want to be? We, we need to be careful about trying to think of ourselves as so wise and so prudent. I'll just want to be that, that, that babe before the Lord, that child before the Lord. These babes were the 70 simple believers who received real wisdom and revelation from God. And those are the ones that Jesus sent out. Those are the ones that Jesus rejoiced so beautifully in spirit. Jesus praised his father in times of joy. And we should too. Now, Jesus also showed that worship is relevant to the pains of life. And for that, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 26, verse 30. Matthew chapter 26, we're just about ready to leave the upper room. They've had the last supper. Jesus has departed, excuse me, Judas has departed. They've paid the bill, whatever that was, and they're ready to leave. And it says here, Verse 26, excuse me, verse 30 of Matthew 26. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. We don't often think of Jesus singing, do we? But he did. Now, we know he sang more than this. Now, I'm sure that when Jesus went Ever since he was a little boy with his family up to Jerusalem for the feasts, when they went in those pilgrim processions, when he went as a little boy, when he went to the disciples, they sang those songs of ascents. I'm sure that when they went to the temple, they sang the songs of the temple. I'm sure Jesus sang a lot, but this is the only specific mention in his earthly ministry of Jesus singing. And he sang, lifting his voice in adoration and worship, to God the Father. 
Don't you wonder what the singing voice of Jesus sounded like? But we can know for certain that he sang with more than his voice. He lifted his whole heart up in praise to God. Now, when you think of the circumstance, singing praises to God when in just a few hours you're going to be betrayed and arrested, a few hours in that mocked and beaten and tortured, and just a few hours in that die on a cross, bearing not only the unbelievable physical pain of it all, but even more significantly, the spiritual pain of bearing the sins of the world. Could you sing on a night before that? Jesus could. He knew how to sing to his father when he was rejoicing, and he knew how to sing when he bore great burdens. Now, it says here in verse 30 that he sung a hymn. What did he sing? Well, the Jewish Passover, that meal ended with singing three psalms known as the Hallel the Egyptian Hallel, more technically, and the three psalms that they would conclude the evening with were Psalms 116, 117, and 118. If Jesus followed normal Jewish custom, which probably he did, these were the songs that they sang at the end of their Passover ceremony or service. Okay, I'm going to read to you some lines from Psalms 116, 17, and 118. And I want you to just, just listen to my words, th these words in these Psalms, and imagine these words sung by Jesus on the night before his crucifixion. You ready? The pains of death surrounded me and the pangs of Sheol laid hold of me I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I implore you, deliver my soul. That's Psalm 116, verses 3 and 4. For you've delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk with the Lord in the land of the living. That's Psalm 116, verses 8 and 9. I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Psalm 116 verses 13 through 15. I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he's not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them, and I will praise the Lord. Psalm 118, verses 17 through 19. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. 118, verses 22 through 23. And then finally, God is the Lord and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God and I will praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. You got to say, that's pretty awesome to think of Jesus, our Savior, singing those words to the Lord a few hours before he would prophetically fulfill those very things. You see, Jesus not only told us how to worship, not only did Jesus receive worship, but he also worshiped himself, and he did so in the most pressing of circumstances. All right, one final thing. Jesus also promised to sing with his people. 
Did, did, did anybody think you, when I was reading this and you're thinking about the upper room that night, Jesus singing those lines from Psalm 116, 117, 118, you think, oh, what, I wish I was there. I wish I could hear Jesus sing. I wish I could hear his voice raised with the voice of his uh, apostles, his disciples, his associates. I wish I could hear that. Take God's way to heaven and you will. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 10, 11, and 12. For it was fitting for him of whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings for both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. And this is the payoff here. Verse 12, Hebrews chapter 2. Saying... I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praise to you. Prophetically, in Psalm 22, verse 2, Jesus promised that there would come the day when he would sing praises to God, his father, in the assembly of his people. Now, I don't know about you, but that gives me all the more dedication to say, I want to be among his people who are joined in that assembly and be with Jesus in that moment or that continuation. I don't want to say it's just one moment in all of eternity, but to be there when Jesus sings praises to God, his father, in the presence of the brethren whom he's not ashamed to call his brethren. Now listen, it, it, it makes no sense to me at all why there's been times in my life that I, I've been ashamed of Jesus. Isn't that strange? Why should I be ashamed of Jesus? But, but then again, I can think of many reasons why Jesus might be ashamed of me. But nevertheless, he says it. I'm not ashamed to call them my brethren. And I'm gonna sing praises in the presence of my Father, in heaven, in the great assembly of God's people of all generations, all lands, all tribes, all languages, it is certain that we will worship Jesus. We will worship him in heaven. The book of Revelation describes that worship of the Lamb, no doubt about it. However, Jesus will also worship with us. He'll do it, again, quoting Psalm 22, verse 22. In the midst of the assembly, that's us, I, that's Jesus, will sing praises to you, that's God the Father. Jesus is not done singing praises. And every time we praise him here on earth, it's just sort of a a foreshadowing, an echo of what awaits us for eternity. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for receiving our praise. Thank you, Jesus, for teaching us to worship. And Lord, thank you that you, in a way almost beyond our comprehension, you yourself, Lord Jesus, you are and remain a worshiper. We can't wait to hear the sound of your voice as it sings. And Lord, until that day, we want to lift up now in faith our voices before you to bring you the honor and glory that you deserve and that we can bring to you. We ask this, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.